The following video describes the ultrasound-assisted midline approach to lumbar central neuraxial blockade. The use of ultrasound to guide spinal and epidural anesthesia is based upon the principle that if the ultrasound beam can penetrate the vertebral canal to provide an image of its contents, then likewise a needle will also be able to enter the canal. The key landmarks to identify in a midline approach are the neuraxial midline and the interspinous and interlaminar spaces. The intersection point of the location of these two landmarks marks an appropriate insertion point for a spinal or epidural needle. A clear understanding of the anatomy of the lumbar vertebrae is important for the interpretation of ultrasound images. The vertebral canal can only be accessed through the interlaminar space. A needle or ultrasound beam must pass through the interspinous space in the midline to reach the interlaminar space. The interlaminar space is bounded by the lamina and the articular processes on either side. Contact with the articular processes and facet joint often produces ipsilateral non-radiating back pain and indicates that you are off the midline. Note that in the posterior anterior view, the interlaminar space lies in approximately the same transverse plane as the articular processes and the transverse processes, and these can be important surrogate markers of its position. Note too that in the older patient, degenerative hypertrophy of the articular processes and facet joints can significantly narrow the interlaminar space which contributes to technical difficulty in imaging and accessing the vertebral canal. A low-frequency curved array ultrasound probe is recommended for scanning the adult lumbar spine, particularly in obese patients. The structures of interest are located deep to the skin and low frequencies are necessary for adequate penetration. The wide field of view of a curved array facilitates recognition of the anatomy. The frequency of the probe should be set to the low range, and the focus and depth also set appropriately. An initial depth setting of at least 8 cm is usually required. The patient may be placed in either a sitting or lateral decubitus position. The ultrasound machine is positioned on the opposite side of the bed so that it is in the operator's line of sight. The goal is to achieve good ergonomics for scanning. The probe should be held in a firm but comfortable grip that allows application of pressure, but also controlled sliding and tilting movements. Novices may find a two-handed grip easier, but with practice, a one-handed grip may be sufficient. Ensure that the probe hand is braced against the skin of the patient's back to prevent inadvertent slipping of the probe. There are three common probe orientations used in ultrasound scanning of the spine. These are the paramedian sagittal view in which the probe is placed in a longitudinal orientation perpendicular to the patient's back. Next, the paramedian sagittal oblique view in which the probe is angled towards the midline to penetrate the lateral interlaminar space. And finally, the transverse midline in which the probe is placed in a transverse orientation across the midline of the neuraxis. The paramedian sagittal oblique view serves primarily to identify the intervertebral levels by counting up from the L5-S1 junction. In the simplified approach to ultrasound-assisted neuraxial blockade described here, the L3-4 intervertebral level is estimated using the intercrystal line, and only the transverse midline view is necessary. The ultrasound-assisted midline approach to lumbar neuraxial block is performed as follows. The patient is appropriately positioned, and the top of the eyelid crests are palpated and marked to indicate the approximate position of the L3-4 intervertebral space. The probe is placed on the patient's back in a transverse orientation over the midline and slid 
in a cephalad or chordate direction. There are two possible views that may be obtained. The first is the spinous process view, in which the probe and beam are directly over a spinous process. If the probe is placed over a spinous process, the spinous process and the adjacent laminae are recognizable by the dense acoustic shadow that they cast on ultrasound. The second view is the interspinous view, which is obtained by sliding the probe either cephalet or chordate to bring the beam into the interspinous and interlaminous space. In this view, there is now no bone obstructing the view of the soft tissues of the vertebral canal. The ligamentum flavum and posterior dura usually appear as a hyperechoic line at the same level as the base of the articular processes. This is the posterior complex. A deeper hyperechoic line is the anterior complex and represents the anterior dura, posterior longitudinal ligament and vertebral body. This is usually at the level of or slightly below the transverse process. The intrathecal space is a dark area immediately above the anterior complex. The midline is visible as a dark vertical stripe representing the interspinous ligament. It should be centered in the ultrasound screen. Note that the posterior complex of ligamentum flavum, epidural space and dura mater is often not clearly visualized in the transverse midline view and occasionally it may not be visible at all. What is most important however is to visualize the anterior complex which will signify that the ultrasound beam is indeed penetrating the vertebral canal through the interlaminar window. The depth and length of needle required to reach the spinal or epidural space can be estimated from the depth markings on the side of the screen. Alternatively, the image may be frozen and a formal measurement made from the skin surface to the posterior or anterior complex using electronic calipers. In general, if the depth to the anterior complex is 8 cm or more, a longer needle will be required. In more challenging patients, small, controlled, sliding and tilting movements may be necessary to obtain the best possible view of the anterior and posterior complexes. As the probe is slid up or down, look for the line of the anterior complex to appear out of the acoustic shadow of the spinous process. Once the optimal interspinous view has been obtained, the midline is centered on the screen. The location of the neuraxial midline and the interlaminar space may now be marked on the skin where they correspond to the midpoint of the long and short sides of the probe respectively. Each intervertebral space may be scanned and marked in the same fashion. Any gel should be cleaned off thoroughly before attempting skin marking. The midpoint of the long edge of the probe is marked to indicate the location of the neuraxial midline. The midpoint of the short edge of the probe is marked to indicate the location of the interlaminar space. This can be done on one or both sides. These markings are then extended to intersect, which indicates the insertion point for the spinal or epidural needle. If the skin markings were made on dry, clean skin, they can be preserved by careful skin preparation. If desired, the needle insertion point can also be marked by indenting the skin with the hub or cap of a needle. Local anesthetic is infiltrated at the marked insertion point. The block needle is inserted at the marked insertion point and the procedure proceeds in the conventional manner. If bone is encountered, 
This usually represents contact with the base of the spinous process, and small redirections in the cephalic direction are recommended. Successful entry into the epidural space or intrathecal space is signified by the usual endpoint of loss of resistance or backflow of cerebrospinal fluid, respectively. Note that in obese patients, a longer needle may sometimes be required. And the need for this can be determined by estimating the depth to the vertebral canal from the depth markings on the screen or measured using electronic calipers. For spinal anesthesia, a 22 gauge needle is sometimes preferable in obese patients as it is stiffer and less likely to deviate from its intended trajectory. If a good quality image of the vertebral canal cannot be obtained, the following measures may help. In more obese subjects, try reducing the frequency setting to see if that improves penetration. The gain should also be adjusted appropriately. Application of pressure through the probe reduces the effective depth and often improves the image. In older patients with degenerative spine disease, small controlled sliding and tilting movements of the probe may be needed to direct the beam through the narrowed lumbar interspaces. Failure of the needle to enter the interlaminar space at the marked point is commonly due to two factors, inaccuracy in skin marking and inaccuracy in needle direction. Skin marking accuracy can be addressed by being meticulous about centering the midline on the ultrasound screen and meticulous in marking the midpoint of the short and long edges of the probe. If bone is encountered, any redirections should be made in a cephalite direction first, but in very small increments. If bone is consistently encountered at the same depth, it may represent contact with the lamina and not the base of the spinous process, in which case the needle has deviated off the midline. This can be due to inaccurate skin marking, but it is also important to handle the needle carefully and avoid flexion and deviation of the needle from its intended trajectory as it is inserted. Further experience with ultrasound scanning and recognition of sonar anatomy can be obtained by using the online lumbar spine ultrasound module available at the following website. The website can also be found by searching for PIE Toronto Spine.